Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Power Platform event. We're uh, extremely excited today to have uh, Chris Hamill come in and do a talk. So Power Platform Finance, there you go, the graphics are running now. So Power Platform Finance, sorry, and a few issues in my slide, is a community of finance and IT professionals. So talking about the leveraging the Power Platform Finance, that's so all the different elements of the Power Platform. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's Power BI, Power Apps and Power Automate and also virtual agents, which we'll hopefully cover a bit further in the future. So uh, on the call today, uh, you've got myself, um, Chris Barber. I'm a consultant at Altius in Power BI. We've also got Rishi on the line, who's uh, Microsoft Data Platform MVP. Rishi, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Say hello. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. So yeah, I think most people will probably um, spoken to you before at some point, virtually or face-to-face. -face. So yeah, I'm, uh, I work with Chris as well. And Altius, um, we're now part of Avanard. And um, yes, yeah, so I run this and also Learn Data Insights with um, Naveen. And Naveen, are you on the call? So I think I saw his name pop up. Yeah, Naveen's here. Hi, Go everybody. Hello, Naveen. Hi there. Nice to be here, uh, Chris. Uh, well done, uh, Rishi, for organizing this. Uh, really, uh, really excited to, uh, to hear from our uh, new guest. Thank you. Great stuff. So just let you know, there's a few new things on the platform. So those of you who were who were with us before, we had Belinda Allen, who did an excellent presentation on cash flow statements. Uh, those of you coming from a finance background, which hopefully most of you on this, um, you know, really interesting session. But you can now go onto the site and get the materials and also watch the video. Um, and there's also the information there from the commentary app that was done by Sam, who's also one of our colleagues at Altius. Rishi did mention this, so some of you might have already heard, but there is feedback. So what I'll do after I, after I hand over to Chris is I'll post the feedback form. Um, if you can leave any feedback, it's really useful for the presenters and also for us to collect in terms of what we can potentially look to do in the future. And just up again next, we've got Mark Walter, and that's on the 17th of September. So keeping to the usual time slot, um, Mark's an accounting um, and analytics manager. So really interesting to hear his, his input on the classical in income statement within Power BI. Okay, okay. So that's everything I had today. Um, I'm just going to mute um, you. Apologies if you've just joined. Um, so that's everything I've got today. So I'm going to hand over now to Chris, who's a senior program manager at Microsoft. I um, mean, he's going to talk all the way through um, from, you know, reporting to the CEO all the way down to the analyst. So, Chris, if that's OK, I'm going to turn off my camera and hand over to you. Sounds good. I'm going to share my screen. You guys let me know when you can see it and then I can get going on this. Let's see. Screen two. OK. And go. Great. Great. Come through. Awesome. So, um, I'm going to go through uh, essentially an introduction uh, that's going to cover a little bit about my career path and then some very high level tips and uh, some effective design elements that I found. Um, I'm going to get into the who am I and stuff in just a second here, but um, just to give you an idea of what to expect, uh, high level tips, and then we'll go into a demo from my time at Microsoft in finance building uh, Power BI reporting for our marketing and consumer business. Um, for background, uh, as you as mentioned by Chris, I am on the Power BI customer advisory team. I've been with this team for a little over a year, um, but I actually was in finance at Microsoft and finance and accounting in my entire career prior to this role. Um, so when uh, I think I made that, it was a couple months ago, I made a comment about finance, being in finance and Rishi reached out uh, and we, we had a good discussion uh, spent. I think we went like an hour over our t a lot of time uh, a few months ago or about a month ago, uh, just kind of talking about Power BI from a finance and accounting perspective. And he was like, hey, can you come join this PPF meeting and uh, kind of talk through some of these same things? Um, so excited to be here and uh, happy to connect and answer questions uh, after the fact or at the end of this if we have time as well. I just talked about this piece, um, but I'm going to go through a career path, high level tips for success, uh, effective design elements, and I'm going to demo you a report that really talks through how to uh, build reporting to meet the needs of all audiences, which is a very difficult thing to do. Um, I get asked questions about it a lot from our customers, so I think that one would be very, very valuable for you guys. Um, in my day to day role currently, I on the customer advisory team, uh, we report up through engineering, but we really act as the advocate for our customers. So 
I work directly with enterprise customers, uh, helping them with uh, modernizing their reporting is pretty much the, the, the forefront of my uh, coverage. I'm very heavy on front end. I don't do a ton when it comes to modeling. I can do enough to build a tabular model, um, but when it comes down to like which area of expertise I cover, it's definitely front end user experience. So I'm very, I'm going to be very focused on that as we talk through rather than data modeling. So, uh, career path. So this is a, this is interesting, um, and I, I don't always show this, but I think it, it provides value just to show the finance piece. Um, but essentially, I got my degree in accounting from Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, about, I guess it'd be about 11 years ago now. Um, and I got my first job. It was payroll accounting at a school district, and it was a miserable job. And you notice the Excel icon in the corner. Uh, essentially, my career path has followed this, uh, followed the same path as the way reporting has kind of modernized. Now it's kind of lowbrow to be using Excel when you talk when we look at who like all the different systems people use with SQL and MicroStrategy and all these BI systems that have been out over a while. But um, when I first started out, everything was Excel based, and I did very little reporting. I was never trained on how to use Excel properly. Like in college, they really didn't tell you too much about it, other than here's a spreadsheet, go enter some stuff. Um, but as my career progressed, that kind of upticked, and it went. It was more of a voluntary, I need to handle this task and let me figure out how to do it type work. Um, but the payroll accounting job was pretty miserable, to be honest, and it drove me to quit and move across the country uh, to a place where I didn't have a job out in Seattle. Um, so in 2010, I up and left the school district with no nothing lined up, came out to Seattle and landed a temporary job doing construction management, back of house support uh, for, for Grub and Ellis, which was actually on the Microsoft campus. So that was my first introduction to Microsoft there. So they handled all of the construction project management <clears throat> across all of Microsoft properties. Um, and it was like invoicing and really like early entry level stuff. Not a lot when it comes to reporting, um, but then I moved into a more uh, more peer accounting role. Again, still at Microsoft campus uh, doing accounting for facilities management. And that's when I started getting into more like pivot table type reporting and uh, like starting to really build uh, like more advanced uh, Excel use, I guess you could say VBA and things like that. And it was all just as needed for my own use. Um, and I took uh, what I learned from those roles and I, I landed a job at Starbucks uh, doing uh, lease administration, which at, at, at face value doesn't sound much like finance or accounting, but the role was really to take uh, the field submissions for properties that they had found that they want to open a store at and analyze their performance on what they expected that store to be able to do and be able to determine uh, based on looking at uh, tentative lease agreements and things like that, if it was a, if, if it was going to be a sound decision, and we would roll those things up to a committee and they'd get approved and so on. Um, I did that and started actually using Tableau in that role. So um, that was my first introduction to a real BI tool, and I used it mostly for my own analytical purposes. Um, and to roll up insights to leadership just essentially by copying visuals from Tableau into PowerPoints because that's what we all do in finance is copy paste, right? Um, and did uh, did enough Tableau to get comfortable with it and was moved over to store development finance team to do um, capital planning for renovations, which I used a lot of Tableau and started building more customer facing type reports, customer being like internal customers, not like uh, coffee buying folks, uh, but started building things to suit the needs of other people, uh, which was a very eye-opening uh, experience because not everybody abs absorbs information the same. And it, when you think that everybody understands what you understand, you can end up getting in trouble when it comes to user experiences. <clears throat> and after about a year or so in store development finance, uh, Microsoft came calling uh, and I was actually hired to do uh, headcount planning for the marketing finance team. So this would have been um, essentially planning GNA costs, uh, headcount ramps, uh, attrition planning, hiring planning, that kind of thing. And when I came over to Microsoft, I picked up Power BI 
and I hated it. And this was about almost five years ago now. And if anybody on the call has was using Power BI about five years ago, like bless you because it was a nightmare back then. And honestly, like if you look at the Gartner Magic Quadrant, it really follows uh, my experiences. Uh, Power BI was not rated well. Tableau was much, much, much easier to pick up and use back then. Um, so I tried it for a specific need I had and I hated it and I put it down and I was like, oh, I wish I could just have Tableau back. Um, but I knew that that would not fly if I tried to ask for it. So I ignored it, went about my, my normal finance routine, dumping things into Excel, building reports in Excel, screenshotting that report and putting it into a PowerPoint for a closed deck, the typical uh, finance routines. Um, but eventually I had the need come back up uh, to, to start pulling together some information that wasn't captured in any systems. It was uh, to help aid with like the, the maximum allowable headcount amounts uh, that people could hire to. And it's it seems simple, but it, when the data is not in any system and people want to horse trade these different numbers around like under the hood, uh, we had to develop a tracking mechanism and reporting on top of it to make it work. And it wasn't something that was big enough that like a corporate uh, finance team would build it. So I just kind of figure it out myself. But eventually you landed on SharePoint for the tool uh, for for input. So our controllers could input essentially debit and credit issue uh, entries. And I was trying to figure out what's the easiest way to report on this. And the the person who had uh, created it the previous years that we had to recreate from had done it in Excel and it was a manual effort every day. They would come in, they would go export SharePoint, they would take it to Excel, they would do some modifications and then they would send the report up. Uh, and I, I'm not a fan of doing repeat work or even like consistent daily work like that. Uh, so I revisited uh, Power BI at this point and I realized I could keep a really good user experience on my form and do one entry for the debit and credit side and then using Power BI and Power Query, pull back the, the SharePoint and then cut it down to only the debit side and then pull back the SharePoint again and cut it to only the credit side and then append the two. And I essentially separated their entries into two lines for each entry. Um, and that seems really elementary at this point looking back, but that was what really opened my, opened my eyes to what we could do with Power BI uh, and kind of let me dive into it. So <clears throat> I built my reporting on that on that specific topic and my boss at the time was forward thinking and he was like, hey, this is great. Go build go build one for headcount like attrition and ramps. So I went and did that and then a week later he said, OK, like the boss really likes it. Go build one for OPEX. So I did that, loved it. Uh, OK, now go build one for spend. Um, so that's where we kind of morphed into the next role in Microsoft which was a team that was developed to kind of modernize the reporting experience for our marketing and consumer business controllers. Uh, it was a team of about 50 controllers that we supported, and the goal was to get them out of the daily reporting tasks and get them more into being the CFO of the business they work with, and that would in turn be more rewarding type work that they could go do. Um, and they can get essentially get more out of their job than they were uh, by spending hours on repeated tasks and boring reporting tasks. So I did that for about a year and eventually, uh, and I'm gonna go a little bit into detail on this piece, but eventually was recruited over by Mark Regera, who you probably all know because he's a finance guy and like the face of Power BI externally almost, um, to come over and join his Power BI cat team. Uh, there's a little bit of a story to that, which is a fun one uh, that I'll show you through. But um, it, it was a it's very uh, it's very interesting example of how you can kind of take opportunities and run away with them that end up kind of changing the way that you that your career could actually go. So, um, in short, I was in finance, and I received an email from one of the finance managers. Uh, so what my boss's peer and it said like hey i saw this this thing uh this post on the microsoft golf league and i know you like golf because I've, I've been golfing for quite a while and i know you like power bi and you're really good at it uh you should you should check this out so 
it was to build a report for the 2018 Ryder Cup, uh, part of a brand partnership with the PGA of America. Um, so essentially build a report for Jim Furyk and all the vice captains of the US team to be able to select their team and then to be able to work with pairings after the fact once the team was selected. So I reached out to Mike, you can see there, and I offered my uh, volunteer time to him and uh, I kind of worked on this thing outside of hours. And when we initially met, we had a, a pretty big group, uh, far too many people for designing one Power BI report, which is usually the case. And we had a designer who was from, uh, she had actually developed the PGA uh, Windows 10 app. So no Power BI experience and like complete HTML ideas, I guess you could say. And she put together this wireframe and this would have been in January or February of 2018. So buttons did not exist. Bookmarks were fairly new and Power BI, nobody had ever seen Power BI that looked like anything like what you can do with HTML and uh, like, like real apps, right? So she sent this over and I was like, okay, uh, let's see what we can do with this thing. So I made this hacky attempt and put this together and you can see we're in Power BI in the frame here. Um, but you can see here, there's a lot of hack, like hacky weirdness going on here. Like these words right here, where you navigate, were actually images of words, which was kind of funny looking back at it. Um, and you could click them to navigate your pages. And that was using uh, buttons, or not buttons, it was using images linked to bookmarks because buttons did not exist yet. Um, but as we worked through this project, buttons were released, which made it a lot better. Uh, and we also released uh, better uh, better ways to kind of manage uh, your backgrounds and things like that. So wallpaper was released. Um, and we kind of took what the designer did and ran away with it and ended up with one of the best reports, I, I think, appearance wise to date that I've made still. So outcome wise, ended up looking like this. Um, it has a bunch of features built into it. So now instead of it just being stagnant uh, images up top, there are actually buttons that have hoverability. And really the important piece when, when putting together this report was designing for the audience. And I'll, I'll talk about that a lot uh, as we go through here, but the importance of designing toward, for like, and knowing your audience uh, as you design uh, really showed through on this one because the audience was Jim Furyk as the primary uh, person, he's a golf pro. Uh, if you're if you're not familiar, and uh, he would never use Power BI again after this, and has never used it before this. Uh, so we had to make it very straightforward as to how to navigate it. So, it, for example, when you click the help button, it pops up and tells you kind of how to navigate it. Um, and that's just native using buttons, bookmarks, and uh, different shapes within the Power BI report. And then uh, as we go through um, some of the some of the features that were brought into this to make this really unique and like very straightforward user experience, I started bringing them into more finance re or more like day to day reporting because uh, just because like we needed a very easy to use situation here and we created things like in page navigation to be able to navigate across these topics. You can have this like that same effect in day-to-day -day reporting or even in the finance report i'm going to show you in a little bit here um, where we kind of were stretching to make that user exper experience really good here it's like why not take it back to the business user like it should be easy for everybody to navigate so we had in-page navigation this is uh, one of the other pages on stats where it was the same thing in-page navigation but the key here was really just trying to kind of uh, get everything I could out of this thing because I knew it was kind of special. And I went over and met with the Power BI team because um, I was still in finance at the time, showed it to them. And then uh, they took or the PM at the time, Amanda, she was like, hey, we have to show this to Amir. He's going to love it. So I was like, I don't know who that is, but it ended up being Amir Nets, who's the CTO of Power BI. And that really helped get me a lot of exposure. So when it came time to make a career move, uh, it was pretty easy to get uh, support on that side. So there was a good Forbes article on the project. Uh, I got to go to Paris, which was awesome. I'd never left the US prior to this. 
and I got to go to the event and uh, be right on the 12th fairway, which was a great time. Um, so it really, the gist of that one is I wanted to be able to show how I bridged from finance over to Power BI CAT because the, the CAT team is a lot of really special people. Um, and I don't think I'm that special. I think I got really lucky, but that's okay. Um, and I just, it, it doesn't make sense if you look at it at a high level and just say, how do you go from finance manager to program manager and an engineering team? So that's that piece. And now I'm going to bridge. I'm going to take a drink so I, so I can keep talking, but. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, I'm going to go through some really high level uh, tips that I have just the, in general when I meet with customers and they ask like how do you approach a report design. Um, these are some of the things that I think are incredibly valuable when it comes to uh, just creating something that your end users are going to be thrilled about using. So number one here is knowing your audience. So if you look at back at the Ryder Cup uh, situation, we knew this guy never uses Power BI. He's not going to ever use Power BI again. We need to make it feel like a website or an app. Uh, it needs to be straightforward on how to navigate. We knew we, in this case, we also wanted to know the platform, which was a surface. Uh, so we wanted it to be touchscreen friendly. So the buttons are really big and easy to get to. Um, and also, uh, you want to test your assumptions. So. I like being a golfer for many, many years. There's a lot of things that I knew that were great uh, and we're able to iterate a little bit and get to a point where it felt comfortable. But uh, a lot of times you might think that you know what you're talking about, but when it comes down to it, the end user is the king. And if the thing doesn't make sense to the end user, then there's no point in even putting it out there, even if you feel that it's a good thing. Next one, this is a more of a Microsoft term that we use a lot, uh, but the idea of failing fast. So if you recognize that something is not going to work out, uh, recognize it quickly and get out of it rather than pushing through even when you don't really, uh, when you know it won't be an optimal solution at the end of the day. Uh, next one is iterate often. So uh, any Power BI report, uh, when you take it to your users the first time, they're likely going to have changes and they're going to have requests and they're going to ask questions and they're going to point out things that you didn't realize and having somebody with you along the way so like an end user perspective as you go and iterating quickly and frequently with them uh, can be very valuable and the last one i'm going to talk here is avoiding overwhelming your end users and i see this all the time i had a report get sent to me last week that had 368 visuals on a single page. And there's no way a person can look at that and understand what's going on and like understand the story there. So it's not about the volume of visuals on the page. It's a it's about uh, how do you how do you how do you tell that story without giving your uh, giving your end user too much content in one shot. So if the story requires that many images or that many visuals, Hopefully it doesn't because that's insane, but they better be put together in a really good way that's not going to overwhelm anybody. And that kind of goes back to my my uh, comment earlier on in-page navigation. So if you go back several steps here, where we do this uh, idea of navigating within a page, we have this section at the top that we definitely want to see at all times. If we displayed all of the visuals for all of these different subsections here, across the that middle section there it's just way too much to absorb in one shot and there is a lot of value in kind of guiding your user into those insights by separating them out and categorizing um, rather than just blasting them with everything at the same time back to here okay so this is the last little piece i'm going to cover before hopping into the demo part um, but these are uh, different things that are design elements. So it's not really related to the um, like an individual report. These are things that you need to consider when you're building a report just to, to keep that incredibly uh, rich high end user experience. So first off margins, people don't value margins as much as they should. Um, this is it might sound silly, but if you if you have a report where things are not uh, lined up and there's not good spacing between things, 
it's easy to distract the user from what's actually valuable in the report. I've seen it uh, in meetings with high level execs where they focus in on all the wrong things because of bad design choices. Uh, distribution, so uh, essentially giving your report page a good balance. So you want to have it uh, in, in an eye-catching way. You'll, you'll, you'll notice there's a lot of balance in a report when you have uh, a report that naturally just feels good. There's good balance to it. Alignment, so I mentioned it kind of with the, with the margins piece, um, but misaligned visuals can really easily distract people uh, from, what you, from the story you're trying to tell. Branding and targeting, um, when applicable. So if you're working with uh, a customer, say you're in a consultant role working with a customer, the execs love to see things that match their branding and match their colors and anchor around their design because they spend a lot of time and effort and money on, on putting together those brand books and having those, those specific guidelines. So as close you can get to it to make it feel like home for them, the better. Uh, coloring, um, it's very important not to overwhelm with color, but it's also very important to choose colors wisely that have the right, uh, the right, um, uh, I'm losing the word, the right accessibility. So color can handle color blindness or can handle the different contrast. Consistency, so uh, font sizes and colors throughout your report need to maintain consistency just as in general. Um, if you have a bunch of different sizes all over the place, it can really easily turn into a mess. Accessibility, incredibly important. Always setting your tab orders, always setting alt text uh, when it's available, uh, and using colors that are friendly for everyone. Uh, backgrounds, I'm a huge fan of backgrounds. I have a few blog posts on the topic. Um, where you, essentially you use the, the background feature of Power BI to give most of your design elements so you keep the front end lightweight. And then lastly, there's performance. And I put that in big because performance is really king when it comes down to it. If you have a really beautiful report, but it takes a minute to load, nobody's going to be happy with it. Um, the other piece to that is it's a balance between the value of the insights and the performance. So if I have uh, a report that takes 20 seconds to load, but is incredibly valuable and has a lot of content in it that uh, can you can spend a lot of time in that page, so you're not clicking all over the place and loading and loading and loading, it might be it might be worth considering, even though it might seem slow up front. That's it for the slide piece. Um, I want to pause real quickly and ask if there's any questions and or go check the team's chat just to see if there's anything in there for me. Um, Chris, only one question really is, are you able to share that Ryder Cup um, PBIX file? I can't share the PBIX, unfortunately. There's uh, restrictions when it comes to using the uh, player images as a marketing tool, essentially. So I can't, but I do have examples that use the same uh, feature set, essentially. So if you need, I can send a, a link to my blog at the end. Um, that I, I built, I kind of, when I was starting the blog, so when I started, when I started on this uh, Power BI Cat team, a lot of the people have public uh, facing blogs and things like Adam and Patrick from Guy in a Cube are on this team. Uh, Matthew Roche is incredibly well-written blog and video series he does on this team, Phil Seamark and Chris Webb, all of these like big players with big, big fancy blogs. And I was like, oh, I have to start something like I, I got to get in line with that. So I started <laughs> the blog off and the first thing I did was try to uh, try to write about the features that we used and how we used them for the Ryder Cup. But I couldn't really use the Ryder Cup as the example for it. Cool. Perfect. And then um, there's a question around kind of just what you mean by backgrounds and what you have in your backgrounds. So, so is it? Yeah. Kind of all circle shapes. Um, yeah, so you know. let me show you real quick because that's my favorite topic. Um, but essentially, it's about in desktop, rather than say building your containers in desktop, uh, you would build them. I like to use PowerPoint and create them there, but you build them and upload them as an image here. So if I say add image, and I let's see if I have one handy. Okay, this one will probably, uh, maybe not. This one. And I can bring in one image that fills up my space. 
So this is one I did for this crisis communication power app thing. Um, all of a sudden we have two, one, two text boxes, an image icon down here, one, two, three, four, five, six, like forms or uh, like containers to build into that are all components of one single uh, image that renders. So uh, when you're when you're building in Power BI, a lot of times, like when I was early on, um, and even in the the report that I'm going to show from my finance days in a minute here, I'd take uh, shapes in Power BI and build them here. So I'd say insert, give me a shape, take a rectangle here, and I'd build out like my layout through that. Um, but then after a while, you realize that you're actually adding a lot of weight to your report by doing that. Because every individual object on the page has a has a cost to it, even if there's no query time. If I were to go to and desktop here, my performance analyzer and refresh them, you'll notice that my shapes have time associated. And the more stuff you have on the page, regardless of if there's uh, queries associated, it's going to it's going to end up costing you a lot of other time here. And the reason behind that is uh, Power BI it renders via JavaScript and JavaScript is single threaded. So the performance is really dependent on uh, what browser you're using and what your personal computer, like what, how much RAM you have. So when it comes down to it, even on the best, most powerful computer with using the best uh, browser, so Chromium, anything Chromium based, um, there's a max of it. I, I want to say five visuals that can render at a single time. So the more stuff you have, the the longer that backup becomes. And I've seen like in the example where the that report had 368 objects on the page, it'd take minutes to render. And a lot of those uh, elements were design elements that could be completely removed and cut down on that other time. Did that cover it? Cool. Yep. Please say square. Thanks. Awesome. So now I'm going to shift gears into the more finance world. Um, Udi, who's on the call actually with us here, joined for support purposes. She helped me out a lot when it came to coming up with this design idea as well. So I wanted to give her some credit. Um, but this was I'm, I'm going to demo through a real report. The, the data has been masked, so we we took the analysis services underline and scrambled it up and removed names to protect the innocent and all that good stuff. Um, and it's also old, so it's, it hasn't been updated in over a year now. So uh, none of these numbers will really mean anything, but it's a, it's it's a, the exact uh, same layout and format as the real report. Um, but essentially, we had this problem where our controllers would get asked a really simple question, which was, how much money do I have to spend from a marketing budget owner? And the process to, to answer that question was like, it could be as much as five hours of pulling data from different systems, tying it together, and then giving it back to the, to the business user. And at the same time, somebody on the business side would do the exact same work but maybe slightly different logic or slightly different timing. And then they'd argue about why your numbers aren't matching my numbers. So it was becoming a really big time suck. And it was, it was becoming a, like a, a point in which they had disagreements that were completely unnecessary. So this was, uh, we start, we did the initial prototype of this thing when I was still doing headcount planning actually. But once we moved into that modern analytics role and they had a team spun up that could actually scale the thing, um, we, we used analysis services to tie together these different systems. Uh, and then we presented it in a way that you could meet the needs of anybody from your CVP or CFO for the line of business down to the individual marketing budget owner. Um, and really, I like to call it, I like to consider it like this idea of guiding your users to depth rather than uh, either giving them a high level summary with no outlet to go deeper or to uh, to, sh to give them something that is way too detailed uh, right off the bat. So I'm just going to walk through the report, and I'm going to walk through features of the report, and feel free to ask questions. I have the Teams chat up on the other side now too, um, so I can you I can I can see questions as they come in. Um, so for context, this has it's currently still alive, I believe. 
Um, it's, I think it looks a little bit different now than it does in this iteration, but it had about 600 to 700 monthly active users. Um, and it was a combination of uh, CVP, GM, and down to individual marketer, as well as our controller teams. And the first things first is it has a lot of row level security applied. So um, there's a lot of filtering that can happen that most users don't ever need to go look at. So rather than bringing the filter pane over here, uh, which at the time wasn't very good. It's a lot better now. I'd probably consider it in the future. Um, but we we wanted to have our filters not necessarily exposed because they take up a bunch of space that most people can't really use. So we click this filters button and it'll pop out our uh, our menu of filter options. So just using slicers and shapes and those kind of things. And most users have access to one individual team level four. Um, so opening this doesn't really make any sense to them either. So um, rather than having them exposed, you pop it in and out and the people who really need it can go work with it and the people who don't, don't even have to worry about it. Um, the other piece to this one too is our controller teams would have access to everybody. So they can come in here and they can filter down through this hierarchy of teams, uh, geographies and get to what they really, uh, what they want to see. Okay, so. This is our like super high level view and it's supposed to meet the needs of pretty much everybody. So if you need a single snapshot and you're a marketing budget owner, this would take care of it for you. You don't have to go any more detailed, although you can, um, but you get that view across all of the initiatives that you support. You also get that view of all of the open POs that you have so that you can actually take action from here. So we built in um, things like hover to see the top 10 open POs for a specific uh, line of, or a specific month or type of spend. Uh, we built in the page tooltips again to show the distribution of their committed spend so you can see what's what it's comprised of. Um, and we know that those types of features are not very discoverable and it was a goal of the team to not have to do any real training especially on how to navigate through Power BI. So implemented the same idea that we came up with for the Writer Cup of having a guide. So you click the guide button and it'll tell you all of like how to navigate the thing. So navigate here, filters here, hover here, hover there, this and that. Um, and we also wanted to bring in definitions because we wanted to avoid our controllers getting overwhelmed with questions from the end user, like what does committed spend actually mean, right? So if you click source info, it'll tell you when was it last updated, which is just tying a, a card to a, a number in the report, and then text for definitional type things. So committed is actually this and this and this. And then it, the idea was uh, remove the need to ask those really basic questions that we can answer within the report without actually taking up any real estate on the report itself. Okay, so. We also in introduced this submit feedback, which was just a link to a, a forum where we could actually get uh, feedback from the end users on the report itself. So <clears throat> to, uh, to go deeper, so high level here, uh, there's another view that's a high level, but with a different kind of cut. Yes, and I can show you how to do that uh, pop-up notification as well, Bala. I'll send you a link, I, I have a really good, um, uh, I have a really good blog post on that front. Um, oh, thank you. So, yep. yep, absolutely. So this was the super high level. There's also a high level one that cuts it in a different way. So you can see it by team. And these would normally be teams, but since it's masked, it looks a little different. And honestly, this isn't the best looking page of this report, um, especially when it just says team 06 and so on. Um, but really the most valuable piece of this whole report is this next page here, which is called IO Owner View. And when I go to that IO Owner View, you can see it's very heavy in tables, um, but there's also some visual elements that are kind of repeating the same information on the table. So I'm, I think I mentioned earlier when I was in, like as a finance person, uh, like as a, as most of you, you probably tend to gravitate towards tables when it comes to displaying them for any information. Um, but this report was actually designed for a combination of marketing and finance. So I wanted to bring in some visual elements and be like very careful with colors and that kind of thing uh, to be able to uh, kind of keep everybody happy. So 
this one, while it's table he table heavy, we do have the a couple of visuals in here, so you can cross filter and things like that. Um, the real value in how this thing was was used is the ability to get really deep, really fast. So, uh, an example for the use case is: I am a controller. I go to a meeting with owner zero 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 six, which is a person's name in the real world, and I can come in and see, okay. Mr. 0006, you're 88% committed. Uh, and they'll say, okay, what's that mean? Like, first off, like, I have a bunch of initiatives. What's going on underneath there? Why am I not committed fully? Or why, like, why am I overcommitted if they happen to be? Um, be before this plus sign was created, when we first initially introduced this report, uh, it came up with this idea, and I still actually use it frequently. But the idea of using buttons and bookmarks to navigate the depth. So if I go to IO owner view or uh, button up here and click it, it'll navigate this table to IO owner depth. And then same thing, if I go all the way back to initiative owner, it manages that depth so that the end user doesn't get stuck in that, like I drilled down three times, how do I get back to where I came from scenario, which I see a lot. Um, so they, they get down to the depth they want to look at, and we see, okay, program 423 is overcommitted. They're spending, they've spent too much, or they're planning on spending too much based on open POs. And then in that meeting with owner 006, and probably the person who owns this as well, they can say, okay, 133% committed, what's going on there? And by utilizing drill through, which is in this case, the most amazing feature that you could ever bring in, uh, we can get down to individual transaction detail and just that right click and a left click on transaction detail. So if I right click on the 35, drill through to transaction detail, we can then see every transaction that makes up that amount. And where this was getting a lot of value is as the as the the deep down uh, marketing budget owner who knows these individual line items from the transaction detail, they can very quickly identify like actually this one's not mine. This belongs on this other project or this other account, and then they can go take action on that to go do a reclass or to go uh, talk to the the right people who can take care of the the movement there, figure out what's going on uh, underneath the hood there. Heck back. And then we have the same capability for open POs. So uh, we notice, say we go to actuals, we notice nothing's wrong in actuals. Maybe it's our open PO amount that's actually causing the trouble. Right click, drill through, open PO detail. And this does the exact same thing. And so if you're not familiar with drill through, uh, very, very powerful when it comes to achieving depth um, and very quickly achieving depth. And all it's really doing is applying the attributes of the spot that I right clicked on as filters to a separate page as it navigates to it. So that might sound uh, might sound complicated. There's really good guidance documentation on this that I helped with as well. Um, so I'm happy to share the link to at the end. Uh, but what was cool about the open PO piece is we could drill through. We arrive here, we go March, because we know March is old at this point. Maybe that PO actually should be closed and shouldn't have an open amount on it still. Uh, so we've narrowed it down. And then these links here actually take you directly to that PO and our internal systems in which we can take action to either close a, close a PO amount or modify an open PO amount, um, or if you need to increase it and so on, they can do that here. Or maybe it's on the wrong uh, it's on the wrong uh, account, and they can go move that as well. So we it was funny it was kind of by accident, but we realized the links to these internal systems as we were working with users and seeing what their process was. We realized the links were identical, with the exception of the PO number being tied on at the end. So we created a measure in Power BI to actually create those links, so they're dynamic and uh, take you directly to where you need to go without any extra clicks. I'm going to pause for a second and look at questions. Uh, let's see. Schema, unfortunately, can't share because I don't have access to it anymore. And people are super uh, protective of it because it's finance data. Um, but essentially, they use a traditional star schema in that, in that world and pull from a bunch of different systems, tie them together, um, and you have dimension tables and things like that. Uh, can we put all the bookmarks into the 
can we put all the bookmarks into slicer like if we have more than 10 bookmarks in one different um abhishek do you want to unmute and explain a little bit on that question i don't think i understand the full context If not, that's cool too. Um, but it's essentially. Uh, oh, there he is. Is that you, Abhishek? Okay, I'll go to the next one. Uh, design background. I'll 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 send you the reference material on that piece. Uh, this report uh, for Fer Fernando. It was an iterative process. We started with a scaled down version that just met the needs of one marketing group. Uh, we did. We actually ran that for almost a year um, and letting them, uh, letting them kind of run it through and see what worked and what didn't work. And really, the reason we didn't scale it sooner than that year is we didn't have the right people enroll. I couldn't go build an analysis service model at that point. I didn't know anything about analysis services when we did it. Uh, for just that small individual team, but we we were a really good example of the self service uh, BI that got wrangled into a more uh, higher level, more professional BI uh, world when that modern analytics team was created. Uh, once we created it, we were able to create the report and probably. I don't know, the model took maybe a month to get it right because we're doing a lot of complicated stuff. And then there's another component to this that I haven't really talked about, which is called cross charge, um, which is a manually entered thing through a really fancy Excel form that feeds back to using SQL to our, to our database. Uh, that part took quite a while. I think that was probably a month of work on that one. Um, but the report front end itself was actually pretty straightforward. I think maybe it took, I um, maybe a month on top of that, but all those things were happening kind of at the same time. Um, and again, we continued to reiterate and modify. And if things weren't working and we needed to add other things, we'd go add those things. And then you'd find out like that thing you added actually breaks these other parts. So we have to kind of reform it. And it's been, it, it was a long ongoing uh, thing, but it had a lot of users. So it was worth actually continuing on it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to look back real quick. Bookmark into the slicer. So you can't tie a bookmark to a slicer itself, but you could have a number of bookmarks uh, that do different things with slicers. Bookmarks are incredibly power powerful. Um, and I see, Pooja, you have that question about sharing a template with bookmarks. I have one that's pretty rich that I can give you a link to. Um, but I I'm I love bookmarks and Udi can attest to this. Uh, everything I do is user experience and like guiding the user first. And I could, I, I will I'll be out front and say I'm not an expert when it comes to like visualization best practices for the actual like this graph should be used for this purpose. I'm more of the make it as easy as possible for the user to get to what they need to. So they're like Miguel on my team is the expert on the other part, <clears throat> and he uh, he'll he'll tell you everything when it comes to like for this purpose use this visual. Um, but I'm I'm more of like utilizing those features like buttons and bookmarks to create these real uh, refined front end user experiences. Um, bookmarks have, if you're not familiar with bookmarks, they have uh, three main settings data display and current page, which uh, when used in combination, like carefully in combination with uh, selected visuals can be incredibly powerful. Um, I don't think I'll have time to get into that too deep, but there is, I have some good blog posts on that one. <clears throat> Let me hop back to finance world. Um, so to, to round this thing out, um, we had Probably, or we at the peak, we had about 700 monthly active users for this report uh, that were all using it as their go-to source of truth for how much money do I have to spend. And at the end of the day, we tightened up OPEX accuracy to within 1% of budget or forecast. And uh, when before it was around 2%, which at scale is massive, massive gains. 
um, because those marketers were able to go figure out like, hey, do I actually have money to spend or am I going to overshoot it? Or do I have money that I need to go actively act on because uh, I, I have a, a forecast that for this quarter that I need to hit? Um, so we're able to get a lot of use out of it and they're, they're still using it today. And it's been about, I think, two years since we implemented this version and uh, it's been modified a little bit, but still pretty much the same thing underlined. Uh, the other pages on this thing, so we talked summary, we talked IO interview. Detail view is essentially the same as this table, but spread out and broken out. Uh, nothing too special going on there. Uh, purchase orders, so those drill through pages, I also allow access to them for free form, uh, like doing your own filtering rather than drilling through to get there. So I like to do that a lot of times when it comes to drill through setup. Same with transaction detail. If you want to come in here and free form your, your filtering rather than drilling through to get there, you can easily do it there. Uh, team summary looked at discretionary is just focused on specific line items. But uh, in short, uh, that's that's pretty much uh, this whole report. Um, so I'd love to take any questions. I know we have about five, six minutes left. Uh, and I can refer you to blog posts or I'm happy to connect after the fact if you have very specific questions and that kind of thing. Um, can we ask the questions, did you say? Yeah, sure. Oh, OK, uh, this is Bala here. Um, so I have used bookmarks extensively. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, for example, I recently had created a dashboard uh, with data for calendar year, but then finance would want a fiscal year. So I would create a button where you click on the button on the fiscal year button, it would show the data for the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. So that way the bookmark uh, really worked really well. But when I'm in the calendar year and when I'm selecting certain slicer values and I go to the fiscal, I click on the fiscal button uh, to show the fiscal data, uh -huh. The the slicer values aren't retained using the. That's a I think that's a kind of complicated one because it sounds like you have a slicer for your fiscal dates and then you have a slicer for your calendar dates separate. Uh, not just the dates. Um, it's the like for example, company sales group items. You know, it's a manufacturing company, and it's the same set of slicers for both the dashboards. But okay. we are right. making it look like one dashboard just by clicking on a button and right. I bookmarked right. it. The button clicking on the button would, you know, show the fiscal and then clicking again on the same button would show the calendar. But when I select a certain slicer values, not the date, but it could be anything. Uh -huh. It's not retained when I click the, the button again. Are, so, you navigating, are you navigating to a different page or are you navigating within the same page? I created two different pages and bookmarked it. So I think what you'd want to do is, and I do this a lot too, um, is make sure your slicers are synced across both pages. And if you do uh, a lot, if you do a lot of this kind of thing, so say you had five pages and they all have the exact same slicers, there's a uh -huh. really cool trick you can do where when you go, let me go to desktop real quick. I can I can try to show it. I don't have data connected on this one actually. I'll find one with data in it and I'll talk about it as it loads. Sure. Um, but a really cool trick you can do is when you're when you're creating your bookmark, that if it's if it's if the goal of it is to say impact or reset your slicers, for example, mm -hmm. when they're synced across pages, you actually only need to create one bookmark that you can activate from anywhere that would reset those slicers for you. Um, so your key things, because this is a slightly different than your ask. Uh, your key things are going to be being able to navigate across the pages right? Uh, without impacting the slicer, so retaining your slicer. So That's if I had, right. I'm going to find something to just toss into a quick slicer here. I don't know what this data looks like, but we'll just make it work. So I have this one here, and then I'm going to go to new page and bring it in. And I'm going to say sync on these. So now if I go here, and then I come over here, it'll be the same. So uh, what, what you have to be careful about here is when you create the bookmark, so uh -huh. say I'm on page four and I wanna go to page five, so I need to go to page five. When you create this bookmark, 
it's very important. You don't want it to reset this slicer, right? You want it to retain what it was on. So okay. I'm going to go bookmarks and then add a new one. And the, the number one most important thing here is you'd want data turned off. And yeah. what that what that essentially does is ignore this value. And if you turn off data, in this case, we only really need current page because all we want to do is take that action of flipping the page over. Um, so we'd turn off display. And now when we go over to the previous page, let's see, I got to navigate. So I'm on my home page. And I say I want it to be DB06 or DB0C28, so on. Now, when I click that button or that bookmark here and activate it, it's going to retain that same slice. Okay. Because they're synced up. But the, the neat trick involving these is say you wanted to have uh, a button. So we'll go insert real quick. This might go kind of fast just for time purposes, but I'm going to call this my clear button. Is that the clear all filter? Yeah, so. Yeah, I've done that, yep. But what's, what's a neat trick you can do is if you're careful with the bookmark and you do it for a selected visual, so I can do it here, for example, and add, and I'm gonna do selected visual and you wanna keep data uh, on, essentially, on this one. So right now, no matter what the state is, when this, but, or when this button that gets attached to this bookmark, Right. One sec, let me tie it to it. When this button's clicked, it'll reset it to DB06 or DB0C, right? But yeah. what's cool is since it's, this thing is slight, is uh, synced on the other page, it essentially does it on the other page too. So I could copy okay. this button over to this page and get the same effect without having to recreate bookmarks. So I click it here. See how it navigated the, over to this page five? Yeah. We don't want that. So if we turn off current page, we can essentially have impact across the other pages without uh, without navigating to them. So I click clear. Technically, I'm actually changing the slicer on page five, but it's synced back to this one. Okay. So I've had I had a report where it had six pages. Uh, I think there were five or six bookmark or uh, five or six filters that we wanted to have to take that action. And you only have to create one bookmark to do that clear action if you use the, the feature wisely and say, I only want it to be data for that individual visual that we already selected on the other page and ignore this current page. So then you okay. can activate it from anywhere without having to go recreate a bunch of bookmarks. Okay, got it. Thank you yeah. very much. That helps. Yeah, just, just to add to that as well, I think one thing you can do as well is look at using maybe dynamic measures, like yeah. calculation groups, to kind of show different things. So it's if it's the same visuals and you're not needing to show different visuals for fiscal year versus calendar year, for example, you can just have those as different uh, dynamic measures on a, on a slicer or, you know, dynamic axes even. So it's, yeah. it's possible to do things to do things that way. Yeah, and I think one of the fun things about Power BI is there's so many different ways to tackle a problem. You know, like a lot of times you can do really good DAX that can take care of really anything that a, the same like bookmarking capability can do, and you can do it through slicers, like you mentioned, Rishi. Um, sometimes you need to get really refined on the design piece, so you can either build up a really good background or you can start formatting things with drop shot. Like there's many, many ways you can go after it, uh, and really like the things that I talked about today, like I don't know if I'd consider them best practices or personal preferences, um, but definitely worth looking into the whole idea of building up that user experience through bookmarks and buttons. Yeah, um, so just one last question, I think, before we sure. wrap up. Um, it was just kind of asking around the time it takes to build something like this, and I guess kind of, I know that's a bit of a hard question, but I suppose to, to answer, I suppose if you could answer kind of how you how you plan your time around designing and building this, how much time do you do to, to, yeah. to planning, to designing, to kind of then building out data model and bookmarks and visuals, things like that? Yeah, and that's an incredibly complicated question, really, because it, yes. it's very dependent on the project and uh, it's very dependent on who's the who the audience is going to be or how, like how engaged they are in the process. So I've had projects where it should have been really straightforward, but there were so many hands in the pot that it ended up taking a couple months beyond what it should have. 
Um, I've had projects where like a lot of times I get stuck with uh, redesigning stuff that's not good, um, where I can knock it out in a few hours or a day. Um, it, it's really dependent. Um, but if I'd say to be able to say there were no interference and you had no hands in the pot, you could make maybe a five five or so page report with really high quality bookmarking and navigation things like that in like three or four days probably um but again i do this all day every day and i know not everybody gets to do yeah. Power BI all day every day so yeah and i mean one thing i would say as well is you know it's it's really important to think about the business questions you want to answer right and then and and you know that will drive your entire user journey story through and the visuals that you choose as well as your data model and i, I don't think people spend enough time typically planning a data model before they just you know build it and put tables right. in and start creating relationships so yeah I, you know, and, I, and i think if you get all of that stuff right actually in my experience this stuff isn't isn't too isn't too onerous because you know what you're doing you know what you need to achieve and then it's just right. going through the motions of building it yeah and i always start honestly with like sketches so i figure yeah. out user who's the user what's the platform i actually there's a really good deck i can share about like the journey through a report build uh, that miguel yeah. and i put together um but start with who's the user, what are they going to do with it, and then sketch it out and figure yeah. out. And I, in my background post, I talk a lot about um, the process of figuring out the shapes for the background and how that can actually help guide, uh, that can help guide the form of your report. Abhishek, yeah. unfortunately, I can't share that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you could put a link to what you were talking, if you've got that video with Miguel where you're talking about the user journey and storyboarding, I think those kind of things are really, really important and, yeah. and often overlooked. I think there's there's not enough planning being done, I think, on, on some of this, which is if you're trying to just do everything on the fly and just work it out based on what you've got on your page and things like that, I think that's a lot harder. Yeah, for sure. Um, so right here, so oh, I'll, nice. send, I'll put the link in the chat. So this has, this, this one right here is key. Miguel Myers report design process. So him and I worked this together um, when we were, um, we when he was in town, he lives in Canada and he was in town about a year ago. And we went through like, what do you, what do we do? Because we do this stuff without really thinking too much about it and don't have a dedicated process written down for it. So we were like, how do we document what we do? Um, so this this one right here is really good, um, and he Miguel designed it so it flows really well because he's a graphic designer when it, at heart when it comes down to it. Yeah. Um, other things on here, just real quick, there's a background gallery so you can download pre pre developed backgrounds. Like this is the one that we used for the Microsoft 365 usage analytics. There's a blog post that goes along with that one. This one has uh, this is the one we used for the sales sample, which is a really good one. And just a bunch of like stuff to kind of help people get started. Cool. So, Thanks very much, yeah. for that, Chris. Yeah, that's great. Absolutely. But feel free to connect with me, um, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, whatever, and I'm happy to field questions here and there as as they come across. Great. Yep. Yeah, no thanks. And yeah, I mean, if everyone can fill in the feedback form as well. Um, and what I'll do is I'll start sharing some more stuff that I'm doing actually with the um, with the focus group. So I know there hasn't been much on it at the moment, but I will put some some links to videos. I was talking about a video that I'm doing for SQL Bits at the end of the month, which is all based on finance data, but it's all around designing and planning, um, you know, getting user stories, building a scoping template, you know, bus matrix, star nets, all of these kind of things to design data models. And, you know, doing some of that planning activity, I think will, will really help with, with design as well. So, um, yeah, if you, yeah, I'll put a link out to that. For the for the focus group um and if, and if not you can you can watch it in sequel bits at the end of the month um but yeah no thanks very much Chris. any any last kind of questions nope well yeah um, this, this is yeah. this is this is again um Hello. and i was asking about the pop-up how you would create the you know uh, the de uh, to show the definition yeah yeah here, let, I'll, I'll put the link to that one in particular in the chat window. So I have a really good uh, post on that uh, that gives okay. detail about how to do it. And it's actually a better format than I would have done it in the in the version I showed. Um, but the the key thing to remember is this is gonna this one in particular is gonna talk about um, overlaying that guide piece 
but really you can build in using the same methods, any visuals or shapes or text boxes in Power BI, any of that stuff can be used or can be brought in using the same uh, methods. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, thanks, thanks, very, so thanks very much again, Chris. It's really, really great to have you on. And yeah, hopefully we'll have you back on for another session. Um, there's more of this to, kind of stuff to come. So we'd love to have you back again. Yeah, thank you for having me. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank I'll put the much. posting up. I'll put the recording up as soon as I can. And I'll, I'll make sure I include links in there and, and annotations as well as usual. So, you know, to, to, if you want to watch back on this session later on. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Enjoy the rest of your day.